Convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein, who died by apparent suicide on August 10th, 2019, while in jail facing additional charges related to alleged sex trafficking in New York and Florida, cultivated an expansive network of powerful and influential contacts in a wide array of fields, art very much among them. In addition to Epstein's dealings in the worlds of finance, science, and technology, the reputed billionaire, based on no career at all, engaged with art institutions, collectors, and cultural enterprises, which had to reckon with their affiliations with a figure whose history is being closely examined. This is a video which will focus on one piece of art in Epstein's Palm Beach mansion, now demolished. From 1987 to 1994, Jeffrey Epstein was a board member of the New York Academy of Art, a private university in Lower Manhattan focused on graduate level education, combining, as per the Academy's website, intensive technical training in the fine arts with active critical discourse. In 1995, Epstein met Maria Farmer, a 25-year-old aspiring artist and student at the Academy who, in 1996, reported to the New York City Police Department and the FBI that she and her 16-year-old sister, Annie, had been sexually assaulted by Epstein and his close friend and associate, Ghislaine Maxwell, who is now in prison. Painter Eric Fischel, a mentor of sorts for Farmer, said he remembers Farmer calling him about a physical encounter with Epstein. I just kept telling Maria, you've got to get out of there. You've got to get out of there, he told the New York Times. That's about as far as it went. Stuart Pivar, co-founder of the New York Academy of Art and a noted collector, gave an interview published by Mother Jones in which he said Epstein had been his best pal for decades until he learned of the allegations. Noting an exchange with Farmer that served as a turning point in his relationship with Epstein, Pivar said she started to tell me about some terrible thing, too terrible to utter, having to do with Jeffrey Epstein, and then a minute later he shows up. Was she wearing a wire? And I began to put two and two together, and I realized that something was going on which I didn't know about, and at that point I knew that he had a different life that I was not aware of. In Epstein's Palm Beach mansion, there are at least 10 different telephones. Epstein donated some $800,000 over the course of 20 years to the MIT Media Lab, a research center for technology, media, science, art, and design at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Jochi Ito, director of the Media Lab, issued an apology for allowing Epstein to donate to the research center, as well as accepting Epstein's investment in his own outside funds that back startups, according to the New York Times. In my fundraising efforts for MIT Media Lab, I invited Epstein to the lab and visited several of his residences, Ito said in his statement, adding, I am deeply sorry to the survivors, to the Media Lab, and to the MIT community for bringing such a person into our network. In contrast to now, where colleges are under fire for supporting the Palestinian people, Ito faced no widespread effort to get him to resign. For all the calls of groups to divest from fossil fuels also, there was no widespread call for these institutions to divest themselves from Epstein donations or to donate the hundreds of thousands of dollars received from Epstein to trafficking victims, such as Virginia Jufri, who actually had to escape to Australia to avoid death threats associated with her reveal of who Epstein actually was. In a deep dive into Epstein's social circles, New York Magazine named the art dealer Leah Kleeman among the figures in a list featured in a little black book that Epstein kept of contacts, along with records charting relationships of different kinds. As noted by New York, Kleeman, who sold art and antiques from the Manhattan Art and Antiques Center, described negotiating prices with Epstein as something like a scene out of the movie Mad Max, Beyond the Thunderdome. She told Bloomberg that Epstein, a client of hers for 25 years, wanted deals on work he hoped would make an impression on others. When he comes in, he is Jeffrey Epstein, and he is entitled to a discount. He is big into shock value. 
It was reported that Jeffrey Epstein had remained a named director of the Leon Black Family Foundation, shortened to the Black Family Foundation, a charitable entity helmed by the chairman of the Museum of Modern Art's Board of Trustees, years after his controversial plea deal landed him in prison in 2008. But then Epstein said, or I'm sorry, then the organization said that Epstein resigned from his post with the Black Family Foundation in 2007 at the Black Family request, but remained listed on paperwork due to a recording error. Black wrote to his employees at the private equity firm Apollo Management that his company has never done any business with Mr. Epstein at any point in time in an internal memo reported on by the New York Times. But Black did not offer comment on an investment by Epstein's financial advisory firm in Environmental Solutions Worldwide, a company for which two of Black's sons serve as board members. I couldn't find much on Environmental Solutions Worldwide. I don't know if it exists anymore. It sounds like it's a big global warming scam. The Black Family Foundation is headquartered in Pennsylvania and is dedicated to social progress, which we all know stands today for communism, racial warfare, and genital mutilation of minors. These nonprofits can be audited at any time by state attorney generals. And of course, American citizens can report them for audit using IRS Form 13909, which can be submitted anonymously. Mark Epstein, Jeffrey's brother, served as the chairman of the board of Cooper Union, the renowned College of Art, Architecture, and Engineering in New York City, when the school ended its free admission policy in 2014, and he resigned from that position shortly after the trustees decided to discontinue full scholarships for all students, a policy that had been in place throughout the institution's history. So in the name of social progress and these social justice warriors, we see social regress. In 2020, in an apparent attempt to distance himself from his brother, Mark denied that his real estate company, Asa Properties, had business connections to Jeffrey's investment management firm, Jeffrey Epstein & Co. But Jeffrey had reportedly used apartments at Asa Properties 301 East 66th Street condominium complex in New York to house friends, employees, and associates in apartments in the building, including models connected to MC2, the modeling agency in which he invested and which was correlated to Lex Wexner's Victoria's Secret. According to New York Magazine, Mark then said that Jeffrey did not own any shares of the Asa properties building as if that made a difference. Additionally, Jonathan Barrett, a managing director at investment firm Luminous Management, who worked at J. Epstein & Co. and Asa Properties in the 1990s, told the Wall Street Journal that at the time he worked for Asa, he believed the two companies were affiliated. Artworks in Epstein's possession that are repeatedly shown uh, include Parsing Bill, a painting of Bill Clinton in a blue dress and red high heels, supposedly his wife's clothing, by Petrina Ryan Clyde, who attended the New York Academy of Art. That work, and another by Ryan Clyde, War Games, which is disgusting and shows former President George Bush playing with paper airplanes and blocks in the wake of September 11th, were exhibited at the Academy's 2012 Tribeca Ball. But the artist told Artnet News that she had completely lost track of Parsing Bill when it was sold seven years ago. So it was a complete surprise to me to learn that it wound up in Epstein's home. At a 10,000 acre New Mexico ranch, where according to the New York Times, Epstein had hoped to seed the human race with his DNA by impregnating women, a work depicting an underage girl lying atop a dead lion was on view. And Vice rounded up other oddities in Epstein's collection, including a nude portrait of a woman in his bathroom with one breast exposed, a stuffed poodle, and a life-sized female doll hanging from a chandelier at his mansion on the Upper East Side, uh, harking back to Podesta's art collection, which included a ma nude man hanging from the ceiling. 
The New York Times previously reported that the same mansion was home to a mural on its second floor depicting a photorealistic prison scene that included barbed wire corrections officers and a guard station with Mr. Epstein portrayed in the middle, as well as a chessboard with custom pieces modeled after his female staff members. And in his Palm Beach mansion home, the kitchen was also tiled black and white like a chessboard. In his interview with Mother Jones, former friend Stuart Pivar offered the following explanation for what might tie together Epstein's taste in art. Jeffrey was amused to have in his house fake art, which looked like real art. He was amused to put one over on the world by having fake art. He thought that he was seeing through the fallacy. This sentiment is similar to the transcendent theory of surrealism, and you can learn more about surrealism and Man Ray in the video on this channel. French surrealist school founder Eugenie Grindel once stated the most famous words in the surrealist canon, the earth is blue like an orange. This directive to ignore one's eyes for some supposed deeper truth comes to light when we look through the art in Epstein's Palm Beach mansion, which has since been demolished. This video will focus on one piece of art specifically found near one of the mansion bathrooms near the pool. In this work, we see four bent female figures in the foreground and background, and one male off to the left, and one central female nude figure with her legs open. Three orange earthenware pots are upright, and three others have been spilled on the right. The number six relating to the number of figures is of importance to Epstein as a Jew. He would have been very familiar with the six-pointed star of David, and 666 is the number of the beast. A red or orange liquid spills out of the pots onto or through the central woman's legs. We see a grass skirt in green on one woman to the left pointing to a tropical theme, and the background on the right also seems tropical with green and blue colors. These two sort of squares on the right look like two eyes, giving the viewer a sense of nature watching or nature being a component of the art as well. Let's look at bloodletting from tropical settings in history to see if we can understand this painting better. Bloodletting was and is a common practice among Satanists and various pagan groups. Bloodletting was performed on large scale by the Mayan for 1,500 years by piercing a soft body part, generally the tongue, and scattering the blood or collecting it on a plate, which was subsequently burned. The act of burning the sacrificed blood symbolized the transfer of the offering to the gods via its transformation into rising smoke into the sky. This is also a common theme in Satanism. Piercing was accomplished using obsidian blades, stingray spines, or shark's teeth. Under some circumstances, a rope with attached thorns or obsidian flakes would be pulled through the tongue by others, meaning multiple people had to be present for the bloodletting. Modern anthropologists say the bloodletting was done through the ears only in an attempt to downplay the cruelty of Central America and Central Americans, but that is false. Jade or stone spines and teeth have been found in the archaeological record. Some of these jade artifacts were dull, but they might have been used after the initial cut was made or might have been ritualistic objects not used in actual bloodletting, again emphasizing the need for multiple individuals at the site of the bloodletting. The location of the bloodletting on the body often correlated with an intended result or a corresponding symbolic representation. For example, drawing blood from the genitals would be done with the intent of increasing or representing human fertility. Ritualized bloodletting was typically performed by elites, settlement leaders, and religious figures or shamans within contexts visible to the public. Public viewing was essential to the practice, and so we have this hiding in plain sight element with the Epstein artwork. The rituals were enacted on the summits of pyramids or on elevated platforms that were usually associated with broad and open plazas or courtyards where the masses could congregate and view the bloodletting and Epstein's temple is an ideal um, atmosphere for that.
This was done so as to demonstrate the connection the person performing the sacrifice had with the sacred sphere and as such a method used to maintain political power by legitimizing their prominent social, political, and ideological position. While usually carrying out by a ruling male, prominent females were also known to have performed the act. And so you needed this male and female component, and we've seen Jeffrey Epstein and his love for Ghislaine Maxwell in the um, abhorrent actions upon other people. This has been found in the, in the Central American record as well with the El Peru tomb of a female called the Queen's Tomb contains among its many grave goods a ceremonial stingray spine. One of the best known lintels from Miss O America is the Yax Chilean lintel 24, which shows a woman drawing a barbed rope through her tongue. In front of her, her husband and the ruler of the Yax Chilean shield jaguar is shown holding a torch and so they underwent the bloodletting together. Among all the Mesoamerican cultures across Central America, in whatever form was and is a deeply symbolic gesture and highly ritualized activity with strong religious and political significance is bloodletting. With millions of Central Americans coming over the southern border every year, now taking over the populations of Ohio and Wyoming, that is the amount of illegals coming over the southern border now eclipse populations of actual states. These are the views that they are bringing. Various kinds of sacrifice were performed within a range of socio-cultural contexts and in association with a variety of acti acti activities, from mundane everyday activities to those performed by the elites. So bloodletting was incredibly common. The social structure they believed had to be maintained by showing that rulers' blood sacrifice to the gods was constant. At its core, sacrifice symbolized the renewal of divine energy and in doing so, the continuation of life. The ability of bloodletting to do this is based on two intertwined concepts that are prevalent in many non-Christian belief systems. The first is that the notion that the gods had given life to humankind by sacrificing parts of their own bodies. The second is the central focus of the mythology of human blood, which signifies life. Within this belief system, human blood was partially made up of the blood of the gods who sacrificed their own divine blood in creating life in humans. Thus, in order to continually maintain the order of the universe, these non-Christians believe that blood has to be given back to the gods and that there is no savior such as Jesus Christ. The rulers are giving their blood to empower the gods in return for giving them life and so it is this cycle. A proposed translation of the Epi-Olmec culture's La Merhara Stella I, dated to roughly AD 155, tells of the ruler's ritual bloodletting by piercing his fatty tissue, as well as what appears to be the ritual sacrifice of the ruler's brother-in-law, so entire humans are also sacrificed. Bloodletting permeated Mayan life. Kings performed bloodletting at every major political event. Building dedications, burials, marriages, and births all required bloodletting. Um, bloodletting was also a means to a vision quest where fasting, loss of blood, and perhaps hallucinogenics in cacti and other materials led to visions of ancestors or gods. Contemporaneous with the Maya um, is another tribe at South Balancourt, and this is a group which shows that the blood was actually drank as well, and it was drank in the alcoholic ritual drink known as pulque. In iconography, we see a very similar setup to the Epstein bloodletting artwork. We see five adult women across Mayan artwork and one man forming that six-pointed star. In some Mayan iconography, there are children, which affirms the fact that these events were done at every consequential family event, such as births. The women are often bent over to access the fat, fleshy areas of the body for cutting, and we see that uh, position again in Epstein's work. Following the Spanish conquest of the Aztecs in 1521, many Spanish missionaries arrived and recorded graphic descriptions of these rituals among both the Mayan and Nahuatl speaking peoples. The 
the viewing of these bloodletting rituals really accelerated the Spanish need to convert many of these people to Catholicism. And what they wrote is repeated here in the Diago de Landa 1566 manuscript. At times, they sacrificed their own blood, cutting all around their ears in strips, which they let hang as a sign. At other times, they perforated their cheeks or the lower lip. Again, they made cuts in parts of the body or pierced the tongue crossways and passed stalks through, causing extreme pain. Again, they hewed at the superfluous part of their bodies, leaving the flesh in the form of two floppy ears in the genitals. It was this custom which misled the historian general of the Indies to say that they practiced circumcision, but they did not. It was just genital mutilation. The bloodletting image in the Palm Beach mansion is one of a pair, with the other being an image of two blacks with elongated limbs morphing into each other. Is this a continuation of the bloodletting theme where the limbs were ostensibly cut one of the figures has his eyes covered, the other has his eyes open. The one with his eyes open has some sort of shackle around his ankle. And of course, we know that slavery was an incredible part of the Jewish people's history. And you can learn more about that on the Belmont and Rothschild videos on this channel. This image in Epstein's mansion seems to have many correlations to the concept of buck breaking, which has floated around the black community for decades. This image was a lot harder to see from the Palm Beach County attorney's footage, so it was not focused on here. Now let's look at a group as I'm sure you know that has the monopoly on bloodletting in the United States. And this is, of course, the blood donation group, the American Red Cross. The Red Cross's reputation has hardly been squeaky clean in recent years with their work with UN peacekeepers in Haiti trafficking children, which unfortunately resulted in no arrests. In the identity of these traffickers, we saw an overwhelming number come from Central and South America, again emphasizing this cultural difference that exists across the Northern and Southern Hemispheres. The Red Cross works with some very questionable groups, and they actually work with the Satanist chapter of San Francisco for blood draws. This Satanist chapter requires 666 individuals annually to give blood to the Red Cross, and this event is publicized on the Red Cross website, replete with the Red Cross trademarked logo and redcross.org link. Satanists freely say blood for Satan, and the message is the same, that bloodletting is a largely Satanist practice.